Okay, welcome and thank you for attending today's webinar sponsored by Simulate Corporation. I'm Brian Harrington and I'll be taking you through a project management uh, presentation today. So I'm going to uh, touch upon some of the experiences that I've had throughout my career. So let's take a little bit uh, look at uh, a little bit about my experience in the past. Um, I have 20 years experience with Ford Motor Company. Um, in that I was a technical specialist um, around simulation. Um, for the most part I conducted um, quite a few studies with product process driven design, uh, designing in a manufacturing context, and a lot of years in the field of discrete event simulation. Um, so I've designed quite a few systems um, for the body shop, paint shop, and final operations. Um, at, in automotive, that's our vehicle operations um, in those three different type of facilities. And along the way, I've got certified as a black belt, um, so conducted quite a few Six Sigma uh, projects also. And a lot of these were, were designed for Six Sigma, uh, designing new material handling systems, it could be a electric monorail system, power and free systems, um, things like that. Also, a lot of sequencing issues, how things come together and uh, important rendezvous. Um, so, from there, I, um, or after leaving, after 20 years at Ford, I left. I started my own simulation um, company called Mountain Sim, and I continued to deliver uh, models for clients. Um, through consultation or consulting, um, I also conduct uh, training and uh, coaching for uh, simulation, and I act as a technical ambassador for uh, Simulate Corporation. So um, let's go ahead and get started in today's uh, topic. Um, before we do, actually, I just want to uh, cover a couple of house point, or housekeeping points. Um, you are now in the listening only mode. So your audio has been um, uh, muted, but we do want you um, to ask questions. Um, so along the way, if you could just uh, type your questions within the chat window, um, we'll be happy to answer them at the end of the presentation. Um, so feel free to just ask any question along the way. You don't have to wait till the end. And um, we will also post these um, on our uh, simulate uh, forum. And we will also be recording this session and the, the entire session will be posted on uh, the simulate.com site. Okay, so some of the, this is just the high level agenda of what we're going to cover. We're going to look at some of the facts um, that around uh, project management. We're going to look at some of the, um, also some of the factors to consider when managing, um, it could be even a, a large project or a small project. So just some of the uh, important factors to consider. Um, we'll look, then we'll step into some tools that can help us identify uh, some key input factors. We'll look at the decision making process when we're actually using simulation. And then ultimately we'll be creating trade-offs and looking at this balancing act, how when we're doing project management how we can balance and, and uh, keep uh, time, money, and quality together and working in harmony um, and not let one get out of sync or spend too much time on one of these factors and neglect another uh, important factor. So keeping a balance uh, with, it, with all three of these important factors when managing a project. So this is a study from, a really interesting study from the IBM Institute for Values. Um, there was two studies that, uh, the, the bullet points here, one study was conducted in 2010, and then one more uh, recently in, in uh, this calendar year, 2014. Um, it's an article um, that they call Making Change Work. Um, and I, I, I recommend that you go take a look at this, because um, it, it truly is a, a interesting article and it's packed full of good statistics. But the, the statistics are actually a little bit alarming um, as you can um, see. But a little bit about the, uh, 
this was a large study. It was uh, conducted worldwide, included 48 countries, sampling uh, up to between uh, 1,400 and 1,500 uh, managers from various companies. And these companies were in the IT uh, sector, manufacturing sectors, uh, commercial sales, uh, consulting, so quite a, a wide spectrum of companies and sampling from middle management to upper management and looking at from large to small um, projects and how did these projects meet their objectives. In the first study we can see that 60 percent of these projects actually fail to meet their pro uh, objective. Um, so that's a really high failure rate. 44 percent of them usually will miss one of their important factors of cost, quality, and time. And 15 percent of them completely miss their target altogether and they're either canceled or, or the project's closed by upper management. More recently, in the 2014 study, um, majority, again, ma the majority of the uh, projects fall short of their mark. 35 percent come in uh, moderately successful, so they're only hitting some of their important objectives. Now, they could be getting delayed, um, del uh, late launches, or uh, late pro uh, product changes. Um, and 45 percent of them fall below the average success rate. So there's only 20 percent of these companies that were, that were uh, surveyed that are actually hitting the mark. And then within this article they call these companies and these managers the change architects. These are employees and companies that are doing things extremely right and have a high success rates on their projects. And so what are they doing to uh, create this successful atmosphere within the organization. So let's take a look at uh, stepping into the, the pillars of cost, quality, and time. We know that these, these must be met for even a small project or a large project, it doesn't matter, but we need to deliver uh, the project within the budget, within the affordable business structure of the company. We need to deliver them on time. We have project timing, milestones to be delivered, and we have to, as a company, uh, with the uh, competition that exists out there, we need to strive for continuous improvement of our, of our quality. So this puts a lot of pressure on our project management. We have the three pillars of these important factors. And someone, as in the uh, upper management and middle, middle management, needs to manage these and make sure that all three pillars are communicating and, and uh, information is flowing from each one of them, keeping the project on target and balanced. So this sounds great to upper management. You know, con but yet we know that these are conflicting objectives. You know, how do we cut costs? And reduce time and yet improve in quality? Uh, how do we avoid late changes in the game? How do we adapt to when things actually do need to be changed um, or, or, or abandoned and, and taking on another uh, avenue? Um, so this is, we're going to step into this, uh, some of these areas and look at how we can keep these things uh, balanced. So when we look at the enterprise, uh, sure, the enterprise of the uh, has to meet these, or the, the pressure on the enterprise that's creating this is that beating your competition to market is creating the, uh, a, a shorter development period or time frame, pushing in the, the, the uh, goalposts, and making it a shorter amount of time to get the work done. So we want to get our new product to market before our competition and yet we want to deliver it in best in class quality. So this all sounds great, like I say, to the upper management. It's really what the enterprise needs to uh, create success and this puts the pressure on the project management team. So most successful companies uh, do use some, some type of discrete event simulation or, or various uses of simulation to address these uh, factors when it comes to quality, cost, and time. 
So we are seeing, but we, but each one of these companies have different success rates at their overall uh, project management studies on how they're actually conducting these studies, when they're conducting these studies, and the and what is going more importantly, and what is going into these studies. So what is critical? How do we how do we focus on on the important pieces when it comes to cost, quality, and time? What are some of the tools that we can use that can help point us in the right direction to to uh, bring out of the out of the uh, many different factors that come into uh, large projects? So one of the tools, and this is leveraging some Six Sigma uh, tool sets, and this is just a cause and effect diagram. This is something that's used early on in Six Sigma uh, projects um, in the, within the define stage. You know, but, it, but it's an excellent tool for just uh, applying and doing some brainstorming, um, looking at, in this example, we're looking at the generic uh, causes. Um, they are the materials, the methods, the people, the machinery and equipment that all attribute to a certain effect. In this example we're saying the effect could be uh, not achieving the desired throughput of the system. Maybe this, this system we're expecting to get 60 parts per hour and we're falling short. So we would populate the bones, if this is a fishbone diagram, with the materials that contribute to this. You know, materials could be uh, some of the input and data that's required. Machinery could be robots, the methods, the processes on how we're doing that, the skilled trades that are involved. Um, and ultimately, we can do this type of fishbowl and diagram for uh, not only our, our cost and our quality and time, but well, all three of them. So we could do many of these fishbone di diagrams looking at the various cause and effect um, with respect to each, all three of these uh, factors. And, and more importantly, once we have these critical tools identified within our defined stage, uh, again, this is a, another a common Six Sigma tool. It's a quality functional deployment uh, matrix. We can pump these critical two factors into a QFD. And the QFD, um, a lot of uh, um, companies are, in, are familiar with these. You know, it's, it's in other words, it's been out um, for quite a long time, and so on. Uh, QFDs do take a little bit of a learning curve behind them. Um, you know, they can become extremely long matrices, uh, but basically, it is uh, usually uh, housed in a, in a, in a Excel format. And in a nutshell, what it does is it identifies the uh, voice of the customer or the, or the what, what is important and how, how we go about doing it or what are the technical requirements. And the correlation or the interrelationships between these hows. And we can put a subjective rating against them. So uh, with this rating and, the, and, and looking at the what's uh, strongly correlated and uh, lightly correlated. Um, ultimately, it will help us uh, uh, define the user requirements into the design parameters, um, and it'll be a, an excellent tool for prior, prioritizing what is most important. So the, uh, a QFD is, is a great tool that takes us, when we, when we think of Six Sigma projects, it actually takes us into the measuring and, and a little bit into the analysis phase uh, of, of, a, of a project. So um, you, you're definitely uh, defining what your critical twos are and putting them into a, into a matrix. And it's also an excellent tool that can be used for comparison, just simple comparisons. You can say that if we were looking at six different products, um, you can put these six different products into a QFD format and do these subjective ratings and, 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 and ultimately you would see which one of these products would work the best um, for that particular situation. 
So once we have some of these uh, metrics identified and so on, we can easily push those into um, a simulation. Um, so this is an example. We're looking at um, a, a body shot model, and this is this body within this body shot model. We can pump in some of these cost factors, some of these quality factors, and of course um, time factors into all within the umbrella of discrete event simulation. So some of the simulation metrics that um, just come kind of pretty much, uh, you know, the common common metrics that are involved when we when we look at uh, developing a simulation model uh, throughput. A lot of times we call throughput jobs per hour, or it would be parts per hour. How many uh, vehicles this shop is making within one hour's time? Throughput could be affected by uh, changeovers, you know, change weld tip changeovers when it comes to uh, change, you know, maintaining a robot, uh, batch build processes. So there's quite a few things that could be baked into this model that that affect the throughput. Um, some simple metrics, um, but very important on quality, could be just introducing um, your repair rates. How often uh, a certain piece of equipment or the product needs to be repaired. How often things um, get scrapped or destructive testing, things of, things of that nature. But just simple counts um, are extremely important when it comes to uh, quality. And some of the metrics and cost um, could be, or the cost figures, uh, we'll look at that in more detail. But some of the um, just high level costs would be the cost of the number of carriers in the system, the cost of the number of pallets in a palletized loop of the system, the number of uh, material handling constructs that exist, uh, the number of forklifts or tugs and racks, um, and of course the number of uh, robots within a, a particular uh, a line. When we when we step into um, this model, there's also uh, cost statements that are or cost metrics that are um, baked into um, the, the simulation itself. So within the simulation, when, when these vehicles are being, uh, going through the sequential lines and ultimately going through the entire uh, model, we can add, um, you can step into any one of these lines um, and, and there is a finance uh, button. And within that finance button, we can go ahead and add capital costs, um, the usage costs. So we can, we can put in cost information that actually resides um, on each one of these parts as it traverses through the system. And then at the end, um, at the pay points or the ends, we can look at some of the, the revenue per unit. And ultimately that would create an income, an income statement for us that we can actually track our costs and our revenue generated and ultimately look at the profit that this system could be uh, producing um, for a year's production. Okay, it's time. I'd like to um, just take a, a, a minute and just pull our audience. So we're going to do a, a question. We're just going to look at, uh, um, we're going to go ahead and launch this uh, poll question. It's going to be, does your company's managers use simulation results when comparing uh, costly proposals? So the poll um, should be open. So we'll give uh, the audience a minute to uh, answer these uh, questions and we'll take a look at the uh, results. Okay, can we, uh, can we take a look at the results? We're going to have to come back to that in the session. For some reason, I'm not seeing the results uh, on my screen. So, but I do. I would like to uh, 
look at these results when we when we return at the end because we can relate those to some of the IBM uh, study. I think it would be interesting to see um, if we are using simulation on some of these important factors. Let's go ahead and I'll return. I'll get those results uh, at a later a later point. So let's step into some of the uh, factors, or we'll, we'll step into and give a, a little bit of an example. So when it comes to cost, the biggest thing for your uh, for the for your for the dollar is cost avoidance. When we're when we're conducting simulation studies, there, there's going to be quite a few different proposals on the table. There's going to be a lot of different layouts, suggestions, different vendors are coming in with different solutions. So when we can conduct these simulation studies up front early on in the uh, process timing, we can compare these simulation results. We can, we can then put aside uh, some uh, solutions and you can avoid that, avoid going down that path. That itself can uh, definitely reduce the overall costs when it comes to project management. So you don't travel down some costly solution and then find out uh, at, you know, later in time that it's not going to work or you're not going to see the benefit. So um, testing that out and avoiding costs is extremely important when it comes to uh, managing a project. Another important area is when you do discover something uh, within a simulation and that can be replicated, and replicated within your processes, rep replicated within your methodology, or more importantly, replicated within your plants or for your or your facilities, um, then you can start uh, compounding those uh, uh, savings. So, if something is discovered and it works well in one plant, why can't it work well in another plant? So that goes uh, very hand in hand with uh, even standardization, standardizing on some of the processes that you have, and so that can lead through breakthrough discoveries when you actually. Uh, get it into the replication phase. So additional uh, metrics that we looked at, we looked at those, um, um, a lot of those are baked into uh, uh, the simulation uh, software itself. There's the cost per uh, unit, material cost, scrap cost. Um, these are things that are reflected in the simulate uh, finance um, button in itself when it produces an in income statement. So. An example um, would be very, very much what I was just touching upon is just comparing proposed, uh, proposed solutions. We might have had a vendor come in to the uh, company and give upper management um, some advice and some presentations on installing an automated guided vehicle system. Um, so uh, proposing that we abandon the forklifts and tugs and racks and, and use this automated guided vehicle system. This could be a benefit by reducing skilled trades and reducing um, the, labor, the labor force. And um, by bringing in this automated guided vehicle system, uh, reducing costs by uh, labor costs and getting the product to point A and point B or line side uh, in a quicker fashion. So that could be, that could be um, a large difference in cost per system, the automated guided vehicle system might come in uh, much more costly than just a tug and some racks. So we need to, do, so the team would need to know what are the benefits of each, each system and will the company achieve these benefit, benefits. So it might sound like a great idea, but when it's nested within the full facility, are we actually going to reap the benefits of it? So uh, how do we know to make these decisions? So there might be a better place to spend these funds. So when we step into uh, quality, um, very, very similar. Where do we place the quality equipment within your facility and how much is necessary? We, you know, where do we put repair stations and, and uh, uh, logical systems in place such as a, a, a photo eye? sensor or a camera uh, detection system to look at the integrity of welds. So when it comes to the actual equipment itself and the product design itself, the quality of the product and the quality 
uh, when it comes to uh, the method and the process, that's, that's generally where are we placing it within the process. Early on in the process, at the end of the process, um, what type of tests are required, and where do we place a repair area. So this usually has to do with introducing qualities in, in our model, keeping quality within the analysis is extremely important. Uh, a quality example is uh, a vision detection system. Uh, we want to know uh, if, if we're welding something, such as in a body shop, this sheet metal, and we'll, uh, the integrity of these welds. And so this could help reduce the scrap rates. Um, it could reduce some construct destructive testing that takes place. It could be um, every so often random sampling actually uh, testing the welds by a destructive test, you know, uh, seeing how if the, if the welds uh, fail at, at a certain rate of pulling them apart. Um, ultimately, placing these uh, tests in place would, could possibly reduce our repair areas. Um, so when we step into this example um, of the model, um, the model could show the, these red areas right here could be some uh, random sampling that take place. Um, it could produce some scrap, and we could look at the scrap rate that's involved. This is maybe uh, could be deemed as a logical place to put the vision detection system. We can we can test that at different areas, so you could easily move it, place it either upstream or downstream in the line. And ultimately, we'd be looking at how does it affect our repair area. This is the at the end of the line. We have quite a few different um, skilled trades here working on line side, doing light metal repairs and heavy metal repairs. And this would be affected by just simply the placement of where this detection system is, um, some of the uh, offline testing that's involved. You know, this could slow down our, our uh, overall timing, but it could improve our uh, quality, and it, it could improve the size and the number of resources that exist here. So these are all trade-offs, and they all have to do with cost, quality, and time but ultimately they fall under the quality uh, pillar or their quality um, department. So when we step into time, we look at time uh, when it, with respect to discrete event simulation. This is what it does best. Discrete event simulation is basically an uh, internal database of events, uh, events that take place at time. So so discrete event simulation definitely covers the time factor uh, 100%. It predicts the facility's uh, overall capability. It, uh, it, pro it provides insight into system performance, looking at the uh, weight and block states. Um, we can look at uh, optimizing operating patterns, um, day shift, night shift. Um, this is basically planned downtimes. When we're looking at um, at uh, um, planned downtime, predicts the long-term behavior of system. We could look at a whole year's production or maybe one month's production, and, and uh, um, we can also include outliers. You know, how do we? How does the system react when a catastrophic delay occurs? Um, in other words, if a, a line breaks down for it could be even four hours. You know, how does that affect the overall uh, throughput? How do we recover from it? Do we have, can we recover it through overtime, or do we recover it through um, other means, you know, um, overspeed, things like that? So some of the, the these are people that are, or some of the engineers that have been um, using simulation are extremely familiar with these. But see, these are some of the things, the time factors that come into play when we look at uh, building a model. Cycle times, changeover, breakdowns, dwell times in a buffer, uh, resources, uh, their travel matrix, conditional times, the time that it takes to load something, the time that it takes to unload something, um, even the, set, the overall run time. And so the, the, list, the list goes on. But ultimately, when we put all these time factors into a model, the, the result, on the result side of things, this is where it becomes really important. We can look at how all these lines are operating um, together, um, how the, the, they're creating you know, their, their work time, 
their wait time, the block, the, change, the amount of time that they're in a changeover state. And this is where we perform. Um, we can perform some of the theory of constraints and bottleneck analysis and try to pr uh, improve the performance factors, um, the weight and the blocks, ultimately trying to drive out keeping the system working. So usually we want to see optimizing and expanding our working state, getting the most out of our uh, facility. But the overall, when we're still talking about time, this, this was this this presentation was geared upon project management. Um, project management, when we use simulation, it, it definitely reduces the overall development time. It, it keeps us focused on the critical steps and, and it allows managers to make important decisions that are based on data backed solutions and it keeps the project moving forward. But more importantly, what this does is it's what, when we use uh, simulation, it's keeping um, the factors of time, cost, and quality all under one umbrella. And, and so there's, there's not many packages out there that you can actually have all three of these factors within the same tool set. So that we'll, we'll, we're going to look at that, but it, um, overall, it will keep the project moving forward and also aid in making when we do need to make a decision and make a trade-off or a change of, uh, of uh, direction. We've done it early on enough and that reduces the risk. We didn't wait long enough, in other words, to uh, late changes or delays where it requires, you know, installing something and then actually having to remove it or partially remove it or recode it. We've learned about these changes early on before implementation. So that's the key um, part for keeping uh, the project um, moving forward. So it is a bit, a bit of a juggling act. This is a quote from uh, G. G. Reese, um, who's written a couple uh, really good project management uh, books. And uh, within, within, I like this quote because it's, it's basically uh, a quote of saying it's like juggling three balls, uh, keeping your eye on each one of the um, important factors is, is the key to this. And we need to just, um, and we'll, we'll see the trade-offs of looking at um, um, balancing these, these three uh, attributes and some of the trade-offs that are involved. Um, so let's go ahead and do another, we'll launch the poll question. Um, if this happens again, we'll, we'll go ahead and let's see here. So the poll question is, how would you rate your company's success with respect to projects? Would you say that you're you know, highly successful or moderately successful or below average? And these are just not the only the projects that you're working on. It's the company, the corporate projects, the, the large projects, and some medium-sized projects, but the projects that you're working on, um, do, they do, do they usually deliver upon uh, their objectives? In other words, are they meeting their, um, their timelines and so on? Okay, let's um, let's go ahead and show the results. Okay, again, I'm not seeing the results, so we're going to have to, I want to tally them up after, and we'll, um, after the session, we'll look at those. Oh, here they are. Okay. 
Okay, the results actually, 71% um, of us are actually saying moderately successful, and 29% of us, um, 29 of us are, are, are showing below average. Um, So that probably that's probably a pretty good correlation with the IBM study. So when it comes to balanced project management, um, project managers managers must keep the the uh, project moving forward. We know that they, they need they have an affordable business structure. Uh, we have to um, do it within uh, budget and we're striving for best in quality. So um, how do we go about doing this? How does, a, how does it actually, how do we uh, um, keep the, the uh, project moving forward? Or how are some of these companies uh, labeled as uh, change architects? You know, what are they doing to make it, uh, to make it work? So ultimately, what they, companies um, that are, are having high success rates, um, basically, they're doing uh, things that are baked into their corporate strategy. So they they do make uh, decisions based on um, on uh, uh, analysis. Um, they are using tools such as uh, Six Sigma and simulation studies, and they're conducting these early on within their uh, time, within their uh, project timing and the program timing. Um, they're they're uh, making decisions way in advance before the launch uh, or implementation. So the way that they do that, the simulation milestones or or, or analytical milestones are um, within their strategic timeline. And so within these milestones, they'll have actual simulation sign-offs or analytical sign-offs that take place within their overall project timing. So uh, when, a, when a vendor comes in even, if an example of a vendor that was proposing that automated guided vehicle system, we just don't, we as a company or we as, man, as, as uh, managers, we're not going to just look at the presentation at face value and look at it at just the system um, through through a handful of presentations and, and, and uh, bullet points of benefits, we need to see it in action. We need to see it within our facility. Um, so uh, a manufacturing prototype doesn't really exist. It's too costly. So this is where simulation and analytical and model and, and mathematical model, modeling come into play. This is where we need, so when a vendor comes in, they're not going to just come in. Vendors now are, are they're, they're uh, been um, through this enough where they need to come in and they not only with just the bullet points of benefits and the pamphlets and the presentation, they also need to come in with the simulation analysis that drops it into our facility so we can see it in action and they can demonstrate some of these benefits. And so by doing that, uh, the corporation um, usually has their analytical team, they might have some sim simulation engineers on board, and they'll work in conjunction with each to each other with each other and see how that system would actually work when it's uh, nested within the overall process. And this is how we can see whether or not we're going to reap the benefits. And then that decision might be made. Well, you know what? We're going to hold off until on on purchasing on purchasing this uh, AG or this automated guided vehicle system until we do some other uh, advancements because we're not going to reap the benefits. Um, and prior to, because there's some other bottleneck, there's some other constraint in the system. It might not even be in my facility. It could be within uh, the paint department, the next one downstream. But simulation will let us know and let us know early on. So when it's baked into the corporate strategy and embedded in, within the culture of, of conducting business, this is where uh, we can, um, the high success rates come from. So to, stri to uh, stress that point, simulations, uh, the studies must be sized properly to deliver the results at these milestones. You know, we can't build, in other words, the modeling effort can't slow things down. The managers need the results and they need them on time. So we must size our models properly to deliver those at these key milestones. 
And in doing that, that's uh, keeping the correct scope and size uh, when you're building these models. So when it looks like uh, keeping your eye on the ball, that analogy of it's like juggling three different uh, balls, well, this is what simulation models can do. It addresses all three of these areas of concern, cost, quality, and time under one umbrella. You might have, your corporation might have, well, I'm sure it does. It has a costing department, very well could have a quality department, and it could have a lot of industrial engineers that are working on the time and so on. Um, each one of these could be uh, working and doing well under their own pillars. But when we pull it together in an analysis and it keeps it all under one umbrella, we're getting, this is truly creating cross-functional teams where they are all interacting with the, their own cost and quality and time uh, metrics and they're coming together and they're seeing how they interact with one another. This is where it creates trade-offs so we can say, when we start looking at the cost and the quality and the time, we can start doing some trade-offs between them. We can, we can identify where we're going to hold off on some costly imp implementation of something and, and put that money elsewhere and, and put that maybe that money towards improving quality and so on. So ultimately that might uh, uh, show and demonstrate how these interrelationships between all, all three of these factors definitely are overlapping. When we, when, we do, when we make a change in one, it's going to affect the other. So uh, what this does, it provides, it's definitely, simulation provides a, a tool. It really provides the muscle to keep your project on target and moving forward. Okay, that was, uh, that, that leads us to the end of the presentation. Um, I'm, uh, we're going to open it up right now for some questions. Um, some question and answer uh, period. So I'll be happy to look in our, our um, chat window and um, take on any uh, questions that you might have. Let me see if some questions are coming in. Okay, one of our first questions is, um, what is one of the most common problems that you see when it comes to uh, balance, balancing uh, these objectives of cost, quality, and time? So uh, that's, a, that's, a great, that's a great question. Um, I would say one of the most common um, areas that comes into play is um, when it comes to throughput. Usually, um, we put a lot of effort into um, throughput is king. So the, the time factor in getting uh, X amount of product delivered uh, within a certain amount of time. And when we put too much effort or uh, all our eggs in a basket in, of, of producing throughput, our quality can suffer. And we can um, ultimately be creating more issues. You know, we see this now in the uh, uh, in, in the news right now. A lot of auto, or some of our automotive companies have a tremendous amount of recalls and issues, you know, quality issues. Um, yet they were producing the vehicles. So what what they were putting too much effort on on focusing on producing the throughput, and their quality had suffered. So th this is a common problem, um, but. Most, most companies now are definitely uh, attempting to uh, strive to uh, deliver better quality. Um, uh, they, they're, they aware, they're aware of rebates are costly and so on. So, um, but, but there's still a lot of work to be, to, um, be had there. Um, and, delay in, and I'd say the next one is delayed launches. Um, delayed launches and um, uh, shooting your, over your project timing. So, and that's usually just because of late changes coming into play. And late changes cost a lot of money. So um, that's, that, can, that can affect all, um, all three of the important factors. When, when late changes come into play and some of these changes uh, start showing up at implementation, that's when things can um, really become costly.
Okay, let's look and see if there's any other questions. Um, let me see here. Okay, we have a question on um, just the high-level companies that uh, exist. Some of the companies that were labeled as change architects, what are, what are some of the things that they're doing that, uh, that create or, or that assure uh, success, high success rates? So on that one, um, another, that's another excellent question. The, um, the IBM article um, definitely points um, out, out a lot of good tips on that. But basically what, uh, what I learned from that is that change, change architects and companies that are doing things right, um, they definitely have it integrated within um, their culture. So um, management and middle management and even lower management are empowered to make decisions um, at at the uh, at the lowest rate, so or at, I should say at the uh, you know going down the uh, pyramid. Um, so they've definitely empowered their uh, employees to make decisions. But by doing or the reason that they can do that is they have a skilled uh, workforce. So um, training and and um, using technology is high on their list. Uh, but when it comes to technology and people, um, th th it's really the people. So um, they have a skilled um, workforce. Um, their people and technology work well together. Um, they're, they're conducting their analysis early on. Um, but the, the, uh, what's really important is that um, it's embedded in their culture. So um, they're, they're um, apt to uh, accepting change and creating change. And when change occurs, they can adapt well. Um, and make decisions and move and move forward. So that's what some of the uh, change architects are doing to uh, create some of these uh, success rates. Okay. Okay, another question came in here. Um, here's the question. If we have three collision centers and plan to open retail centers across a city, how can simulate help us identify which retail center should be sending work to which production site. Yeah, that, that's, uh, I've, I've worked on models um, that are, are sim similar in this nature, so um, Simulate could, could definitely address this. Um, so if you have three coll collision centers and you know, we plan to open a retail center across the city, how can Simulate help us identify which retail center should be sending work the production site. Yeah, so that's a little bit of, you know, um, similar to some of the work that I've done when it comes to like a, a market center. Like within a plant, we have a market center that produces parts and uh, parts might arrive and they come into an area and then they have to get delivered to uh, um, different sections of the plant and they get, so it's a little bit of material handling involved. Um, things like that. So um, the things that I can say on this is um, this is a common um, problem that can be addressed by simulation. So simulation can send um, things that are coming to the top of my head would be like signals. So when we have our, our three con collision centers um, up and running and getting uh, vehicles and, and, uh, into the centers and then they have to be cascaded out to different production sites or uh, to get uh, uh, fixed and so on, we can send them out um, to them. They, so we, can have, we have conditional statements that can be met. So um, if a particular vehicle comes in and it has this type of uh, profile or condition that is met, it'll be sent or routed out um, to a particular center to be worked on. Um, so on that one, I would, I would need a little bit more information, but it's definitely, um, from what I can see at face value, a very common problem, and Simulate could definitely um, track this type of uh, situation. Um, so I'd be happy to, uh, on that one, follow up um, with me, and I could um, provide, uh, gain a little bit more insight into it and provide some additional um, information on that. 
Okay, let's see if there's any other questions. Okay, here's another question that came in. How do you make sure that the estimated investment on introducing new facilities, especially huge systems, is accurate enough for the simulation to make sense? Yeah, that's a that's a good question too. Um, okay, on that one, you know what what uh, what I've done. Um, just on my based on my experience, um, I had it um, lack of better words, I had it really good because we did have a costing department and they did have accurate numbers, you know, so we had engineers that were specifically working on it. They they fell fell, you know, under another department. So that's kind of what they did. And so, you know, I had um, the, you know, cost of robots, the cost of uh, carriers, the cost of uh, power and free systems. Um, you know, pretty much to the to the cents or to the dime or whatever on that, um, and so we did have accurate numbers coming in that. Um, but what I can say is the the, the beauty of simulation, and we do that uh, often within simulation, is to just put that placeholder in because um, it can be it can be a number that can be just changed at the at the you know at the um, at your fingertips or something like that. So an estimate is always a good. Uh, approximation, a good starting point, and and so we never let that slow up the analysis. But I will put an asterisk by it and say, you know, this is just a, a bent or a benchmark or um, a target or a value that needs to be checked. Um, this is what I'm uh, got. I have allocated for it. You know, I have two hundred and fifty thousand dollars allocated for this cell. Um, it includes you know x amount of robots. Um, or I look at historical data, um, or what the um, vendors um, quoting, and we might put some additional costs on top of it um, for installation and, and, and all that. So, um, but the beauty of it is, it can always be uh, changed, and that's often the case where we'll put in some numbers and make our initial analysis, and as the model and as the data matures, then we will update that as well. So that um, really gets into um, you know, your, um, a little bit of your data uh, collection and the ease of changing the data and keeping your eyes on, on the, the data set to, you know, to make these updates. Okay, let's see if there's any other uh, questions that came in. Okay. One other question was just, uh, I guess it's a good question about automo um, the automotive industry, and it just um, was saying, um, you know, how come it, within automotive uh, it seems like there's just um, quite a few quality issues that still exist, um, and that's true. I mean, in in uh, just, just in the uh, uh, news um, just about weekly. We're we're hearing different quality issues and recalls that exist within uh, within the automobile industry. Um, so what I can say on that is, um, I do know that car companies and automotive um, industry is getting better at it. But but if we look at it historically, historically uh, throughput. I mentioned that um, prior in one of the other questions, but throughput has always been. A uh, king. It's always been first. Um, even historically, you know, uh, we, we it was just pumping out. Um, it, you know, the vehicles getting getting the vehicles out to the market was uh, was they put up. When I say they the companies put up that up uh, as their the highest priority. Um, so quality would um, suffer. Um, and in these systems, obviously, the vehicles are just getting more and more complicated and more. Um, into them, so the systems as they become more complicated, sure you're going to get more quality issues that uh, can arise. Um, we're getting more vendors that are working on particular sections of the vehicle and relying on their own internal quality testings to be done. Um, so ultimately, when when the system all comes together, the quality still resides, you know, on the particular automotive automotive company to make assure that the quality of particular subsystems that vendors are doing are, are meeting the uh, quality requirements. 
Um, so all I can say is, you know, historically throughput has been, but it has been shifting greatly. And, 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 I, and I do know that automotive companies are striving to, to keep all three pillars um, up to um, par when it comes to uh, quality, cost, and, and, and timing. But it, uh, so um, all I can say is it's just like technology usually will provide the answer and um, we'll, we'll, we'll get uh, quali the quality marks where, where they need to be. Um, and um, competition usually drives that as well. So um, as, as more and more uh, of the, the automotive industry has such uh, com or great competition, that usually just makes the products um, that much um, better as well. Okay. I think we have time for one more question. Um, let me just check here. Okay. Well, I think that uh, there is no more questions here. I would be happy to um, take any more questions. Um, you can, let's see here, you can post any additional questions on this topic um, send them directly to me at brian.h at simulate.com and we'd like to continue this, discur this um, discussion on our simulate users group um, also on our um, within the LinkedIn group um, and um, I would like to again to thank everybody for attending uh, today's uh, webinar and um, don't hesitate um, to uh, contact me directly on any questions I'd be happy um, to uh, discuss any other uh, topics further and if you have any questions regarding getting simulation into your company um, I, I have a lot of experience with that as well as, as tips on, on getting simulation um, uh, being used and recognized because um, you can see even throughout this uh, discussion how important it is for companies if they want to strive to become uh, change architects within the, within the in industry, uh, discrete event simulation and using a tool that keeps uh, cost, quality, and time all within the same tool set, it's a great cross-functional tool. Um, it can only aid in um, your decision-making process. Um, so um, again, thank you very much for attending today's uh, session, and I look forward to um, hearing your questions. All right, thanks, guys.